As a girl, the scariest thing about playing video games online is most definitely the weird interactions I have with random guys. Like a lot of my friends who play online, will deliberately obscure their gender with a nondescript username and profile picture and will never ever talk in party or game chats if there are guys present, which as you can imagine, there pretty much always is. But I've never been too concerned with presenting my real personality online. That, and I won't allow any creeps to force me into hiding who I am. But that doesn't mean I don't have some interactions or get some messages that genuinely creep me out. And here are a few of the weirdest or most disturbing I've come across so far. So I'm part of the PC Gaming Master Race. Over the past few years, there has been an increasing amount of use of the Microsoft Party Chat thing for games purchased using the Microsoft Store. But generally speaking, the app we use to organize and communicate is Discord. Discord is nice in that you can't just get random messages from users at any time, but if you share a server with someone, they can pretty much DM you whenever they want. And since I'm in a lot of servers for the games I play, this leaves me pretty vulnerable to random DMs from creeps with less than innocent intentions. I suppose it doesn't help that one of my favorite games to play is Dead by Daylight. For those that don't know, it's a horror game in which one person plays as the killer, while the other players take on the roles of their victims, having to complete various tasks while evading the killer so they can escape whatever environment they're trapped in. This obviously attracts its fair share of online sadists, who love nothing more than to terrify and traumatize the people they're hunting. They go so far as to insist on always being the killer, never ever playing as a survivor, and naturally this means they get really really good at hunting people with their characters of choice. That's how I came across one particular player who specialized as a dead by daylight killer known as the clown. Now I hate clowns with a passion, to the point where I couldn't bring myself to go see that IT movie even when my Stephen King fanatic boyfriend was so excited about seeing it. They just absolutely terrify me, probably because, and my mom never gets tired of telling me the story, I had a pretty traumatizing encounter with a party clown at a kid's birthday party when I was younger. The clown in Dead by Daylight is like all of my circus nightmares come to life. It kind of looks like a combination of a clown and a ringmaster, but has allusions to other circus stuff on him too. The face is all this worn out grease paint smeared over a flabby mess of folds, but perhaps the most horrible are the fingers dangling from the thing's belt the trophies he takes from his unfortunate victims. So, when this player happened to prefer the clown over others, I was kind of reluctant to play at first, but the group of survivors I usually play with adored him for the effort he put into role-playing the character, and therefore how much more intense and scary he made the whole experience. Like he kept putting this super creepy clown voice on over voice chat while he was chasing us, to the point where these big tough guys, self-confessed horror junkies, or just squealing in terror whenever he was chasing them. I think that's about the one thing that made it bearable for me, how funny it was when they were wailing like scared little girls. But let me tell you, it wasn't so fun when he was chasing me, and boy did he chase me a lot. At the end of the night, when a few of us were like, alright, that's enough terror for me, better log off before I give myself nightmares, I got a Discord DM from the guy saying, you were really fun to chase. I tried to be polite enough, just replying with something like, Cheers dude, not too much fun to chase I hope, with a little laughing emoji. Then he follows up with what seemed like was going to be a really long message, like the typing notification thing was going off for like a good few minutes, while I'm like, please don't be creepy, please don't be a creep. Then instead of some big long message, he only sends me a few words, I wish this was real. It was creepy enough sentiment on its own, but the thing that got me was that there was absolutely no way he spent so long typing out just five words. What else did he want to say to me that he ended up deleting and retyping over and over again for a minute straight that only ended up with five little words? I seriously dreaded to think what it might have been. The following night, we were all getting ready to play Dead by Daylight again, voice chatting on Discord when one of our party chat was like, oh, Clown guy's online again. Should we invite him in? My initial reaction was like, God no, but I'm not one to be a killjoy. The other guys really seemed to enjoy him, so I just found myself acquiescing to the idea and letting them invite him into our voice chat. 
Everyone greets him like a clown guy, and instead of being polite or whatever, his first words are, Is Ruby playing tonight? He must have known well that I was playing. I was in the same voice chat as him, for God's sake, so the idea that he was asking so he could, like, hear my voice or something got the session off to a nice, creepy start. As weird as the dude was, he had been a great killer. He was passionate enough to bring energy to the character, but not skilled enough as to make it completely unfair on us. He also spent fairly equal time chasing each of us, not partaking in the act of tunneling as it's become known and focusing on one particular character. But that night, all he did was chase me. He would simply ignore any other survivor, searching for me and me alone to chase, torture, and kill. And once he'd achieved that, he'd just sort of waste time, letting the other survivors get the generators going so they could escape the stage and get a new round going. The first time around, his behavior went unnoticed by everyone but me. I think my fellow survivors were just too focused on their tasks and too elated with the victory to really notice what he was doing. But the second round, it became obvious, and by the third, my usual crew was starting to confront him on it. Hey, stop tunneling Ruby, dude. You're ruining the game, they'd say. But Clown Guy just ignored them and started breathing heavily down the mic. Now, this wasn't just him having it too close to his face, which is a problem a lot of people have, and is generally remedied by a quick heads up followed by them apologizing and moving the microphone. But Clown Guy was breathing heavy because he was enjoying chasing me a little too much. It was like you could hear all this gross satisfaction in his breath whenever he caught up with me, and it got so bad at one point that the other party members started to make some pretty crude jokes about his state of arousal. After one particular bad round, and me basically pleading with the other guys to kick him from the game and from the voice chat, they conceded and Clown Guy got kicked. Relief doesn't cover it. This idiot had gotten me frustrated, angry, and eventually verging on upset, I was just so freaking relieved that the others had finally seen what a toxic, horrible individual he was. We only had one or two more games after that, with some random killer we'd been hooked up with via the game's matchmaking system, then after that I went to bed. But as I was reveling in affection for my regular gamer friends, I forgot to do one little thing that would separate me and Clown Guy forever. And the next morning when I woke up, I found the little red iPhone notification marker for Discord that had a number on it in its high 50s. I should have guessed what it was, or rather who it was, that had caused so many notifications overnight, but I guess it just didn't quite register in my half-asleep brain. So I opened the app and read the messages. I know I shouldn't have, but it was like seeing a slow-moving car crash or something and I just couldn't quite peel my eyes away from it, no matter how bad it got. I'll try to type out some of what they said from memory whilst cleaning up the language used a little and I apologize to anyone in advance who's triggered, offended, or upset by what they say. I bet you're happy now. Can't take on a good killer like me, so you just got your little simp friends to kick me. You shouldn't flatter yourself either. I've seen your profile picture and you're not even all that. You shouldn't be one to refuse any male attention either because it's not like you have the pick of the bunch. Keep acting like that and you'll die cold and alone, with no one around to care for someone like you. You shouldn't go thinking you're safe either. I spend my life hunting down people like you, both in real life and in that dumb game. I asked enough questions about you when you were offline to figure out exactly where in the UK you live, and if I wanted to, I could be in your city and tracking you down tomorrow. I got the money, the time, and the patience. I will find you if I want to. And when I do, you'll pray for death before the end. Scholars will tell stories of the horrors I subject you to for generations. I'll put the names of Bundy, Dahmer, and Gein to shame. People will remember your name as a synonym for pain, suffering, and weakness. And my sons and daughters will touch themselves over the trophies I take from you and your broken, bleeding body. You should have blocked me when you had the chance, Ruby. But it appears you've been too dumb to do so. And now it's too late. I see you don't have a VPN either. It was far too easy for me to find your IP address and now it's just a matter of time before I have your exact location, your full name, your family's name, and your friends' names. I will know your neighborhood like the back of my hand by the time I make it there and you'll never escape me, no matter how hard you try. It went on and on like that, just a tirade of terrifying threats and misogynistic abuse. 
and the worst thing is, I couldn't help but picture him doing it, all in that horrendous clown outfit that his character wore. And what I just wrote wasn't even half of it. The language he used, the things he threatened to do with me, got way, way worse, and I don't want to repeat any of it. I don't want him having the satisfaction of knowing he got to me so badly, to the point where I just stayed offline for a few days after having blocked him. I got myself a VPN almost right away, and I'm hoping that's going to protect me, along with hoping all of his threats of hacking were just a bunch of bluster. But yeah, there it is. The most terrifying thing that ever happened to me while I was using Discord. In fact, it's probably the scariest thing that's happened to me online. Full stop. Probably the scariest thing that ever happened to me actually. If anything, I'd like to serve as a warning to other gamers who happen to be female. And I hate the term gamer girls. As soon as a guy even shows the remotest signs of being pervy, possessive, or anything like that, hit that block button. God knows it'll save you a whole world of anxiety like it did for me. My son used to be very active on something called Discord, which, from what I understand, is a messaging app for people who play video games. It allowed him to talk to people from all over the world that play the same games as him. So at some point, he broke the news to us that he'd been talking to a girl over in the UK named Lori. She and he had become friends, playing some sort of pirate game, playing together most days and talking pretty much all the time when they weren't at their computers. And eventually, he just up and asks her if she wanted to be his girlfriend, and she says yes. It was definitely a new concept for someone like me, who grew up at a time when cell phones weren't even a thing, but I understand that we live in the digital age where new methods of dating are coming to the fore, so... I just tried to be happy for him as any mom should when their kid gets their first girlfriend or boyfriend. Plus, with an entire ocean between them, it's not like I have to worry about them getting accidentally pregnant or something. However, one Sunday afternoon my son emerges from his boy cave for what seemed like the first time in days, walks into the TV room where me and my husband are sat and with a very concerned look on his face. We asked him what the matter was and he just kind of shrugs tells us everything is cool, and then just kind of wanders out again. So as you can imagine, me and my husband give each other a look as if to be like, what was that about? My husband gets up, follows our son into the living room before gently prodding him about anything that might be bothering him. From what he told me, our kid was just doing that typical boyish thing of pretending that everything was fine, but in a way that tells us that he's obviously upset about something. My husband then told me he asked after Lori, with our son responding in almost a almost visceral way of like, why are you always in my business, blah blah blah. He'd obviously touched on a sore subject, so our general conclusion was that he and Lori had broken up and he just didn't want to talk about it. We weren't about to press him on it, so we kind of just left him to it to get over and move on to someone new. But over the next month or so, our son seemed to get increasingly depressed. He'd spend more and more time up in his room, only ever coming out to go to school or eat dinner and then just retreating back to his little boy cave. Like I said, we figured this was because he'd split up with his internet girlfriend, but one time my husband was walking past his room and blatantly heard him talking to someone via his little voice chat discord thing, addressing them as Babe and at one point Lori. So apparently they're still talking at that point, but we still assume that they were having relationship issues putting it down to the fact that they were like thousands of miles apart. I know long distance relationships don't work at the best of times, even when people were just a few states away from each other, but these kids had an entire ocean separating them so God knows how hard that must have been on them. Only as we came to learn, that wasn't exactly the problem, it was something much, much darker. So as I said, our son seemed to be getting more and more depressed over the course of the month, and it got so bad that at one point that me and my husband discussed getting him a therapist or something to nip the problem in the bud before it could morph into something less easy to deal with. But suddenly, out of apparently nowhere, he just perks up. One day he's looking better, feeling perkier, and is considerably more talkative. He actually seemed keener on spending more time with us too, which for a 16-year-old boy struck us as very unusual. I mean, not that we were complaining. 
It was nice seeing him feeling better about things and we put it down to him meeting a new girl or just shutting out Lori from his life. This kind of sunny behavior carries on for like a week or so until one Saturday when after coming down for breakfast we don't see her here for him for the rest of the day. Late in the afternoon my husband goes up into his room, knocks on the door and asks our son if everything is okay. He comes back down into the TV room, tells me there was no reply after knocking, then asks me if I had seen him leave the house at all during the day. I tell him no, that if he had gone over to a friend's house or whatever that he certainly hadn't let me know. Then my husband just kind of shrugs, tells me he has a headache, then walks off to the downstairs bathroom to get an aspirin from the medicine cabinet. Next thing I know, I can hear him springing down the hallway and up the stairs, his feet like boom, boom, boom as he rushed up to our son's room. I'm super confused, like what's going on, before walking out into the hallway. From where I'm standing, I can actually see into the downstairs bathroom and what I see makes my blood run cold. We usually kept all our pain pills and other such medication in a little plastic first aid kit style thing. We kept that thing stuffed to the gills and there it was, lying on the bathroom floor, almost completely empty. Then, like my husband before me, it hit me what had happened. So I sprint up to my son's room where I find my husband leaning over our boy's bed, shaking him like, wake up, can you hear me, wake up? There's a pole of puke sitting on the bed next to his head and he's completely unconscious, and there are empty pill trays lying on the floor nearby. As soon as I walk in, my husband runs back downstairs to call 911, and I take over the shaking and the wailing, begging him to open his eyes. Now the only light in the room was coming from his computer monitor, so at one point I look over to it and see one of the most haunting things I'd ever seen in my life. On the screen is a webcam window from the Discord thing I mentioned, and it displays the body of a young girl that's just kind of dangling in midair. It took me a second to realize what I was looking at, but when I did, I almost screamed the house down. She was hanging from something. I tried not to look, I really did. I just tried to focus on my boy as his dad ran back upstairs with emergency services on his cell. I should have told him not to look, but I was just distraught. I could barely speak as he walks back into the room and starts describing our son's condition to the dispatcher on the other end of the line. He's frantically talking away when he does pretty much the same thing as me, turns around to see the webcam window open and the girl's body hanging on the screen. He just froze and stops talking, long enough for me to be able to hear the dispatcher say, Sir, are you there, sir? At which point he snaps out of his daze and carries on talking to the person on the other end. It was he that then had the same presence of mind to turn off the computer all the while giving the EMTs her home address and begging them to arrive as quickly as possible. Our son was taken to the hospital where he promptly has his stomach pumped. We stayed all night, waiting in the visitor's area, and when a doctor finally approached us with an update on our son's condition, I found my heart racing as I prepared for the worst. But thankfully, we'd gotten him to the hospital just in time, and the nurses were able to pump his stomach and administer the necessary medication to counteract the effects of the things he'd taken already. He survived, barely, but the same couldn't be said for the girl on the computer screen, who we assumed was this Lori girl he'd been in the long-distance relationship with. When our son woke up and saw us in the hospital room, he burst into tears. He apologized over and over again, and we all just cried it out together. He then proceeded to spill his guts to us about what had happened, and I honestly couldn't believe my ears. It turned out that they'd formed a kind of pact together just the week before, right around the same time he seemed to have perked up and gotten out of the funk he was in. Apparently, that was what did it. That she and he had figured out a way to escape the pain they were suffering, and that the revelation had been some kind of boost to him, as morbidly insane as that sounds. We went ahead with booking him into therapy and he's doing much, much better now. We don't monitor his online activities as he figured he'd just find a way to subvert us, but we definitely don't allow him to have a computer in his bedroom anymore. And since then, me and my husband have made an effort to acquaint ourselves with the darker corners of the internet, and believe me, there are some days I wish I hadn't. 
because my god are there some horrendous things out there, things I wish I'd never seen, and that I'll never be able to get out of my head. A few years ago I was part of a True Scary Stories server on Discord. It was a place where people would share their own personal stories of scary or spooky things that happened to them in their lives, and for a while it was honestly a lot of fun. Sure, a lot of the stories sounded made up and generally involved stuff like I saw a shadow figure at the end of my bed and other stuff that sounded like they were lifted straight out of a bad horror movie. But every so often someone would share a story that didn't have a hint of the supernatural in it, something that was actually believable and, occasionally, these stories were genuinely terrifying. I read a lot of seriously spine-chilling stuff on that server, but a lot of it I've forgotten over the years, probably because although they were creepy, they just weren't disturbing enough to actually stick with me. But there was one story in particular that I've never forgotten, because it's genuinely made me shudder to read. I hope the user in question doesn't mind if I share their story and... If they happen to read this, I'd like to think that they could let me know in the comments and maybe correct anything I got wrong because I'm telling this for memory. But anyway, here goes. The poster began their story by assuring us that their story wasn't just some fabrication, and although they were pretty young when it happened, just thinking or writing about it as an adult was a pretty stressful experience for them. They went on to explain that their early years were marred by tragedy how their dad had died when they were real young from a drug overdose, so they were raised by a single mom living in a small apartment just down the street from their grandma's place. Mom did some dating, though, obviously trying to do the right thing and find them a stepdad to give them some kind of father figure in their life. The incident in question happened while she was out on a date. Usually speaking, their grandma would babysit for them any time mom needed to go do anything that meant she couldn't bring them along. But on the night of her date, the grandma was working, so although it wasn't ideal, nine or ten-year-old storyteller was left unsupervised in their mom's ground floor apartment. Sounds kind of irresponsible at first, but the storyteller was quick to reassure the members of the server that this was back when Yu-Gi-Oh was popular. As long as they had their cards and a box set of cartoons to keep them occupied, being left alone for like an hour or two certainly wasn't an issue for them. It's not like they were going to wander out of the apartment or get up to any mischief while their precious Yu-Gi-Oh was keeping them busy. But at some point during the evening, they're sitting there playing with their cards and watching TV when they heard a tapping on the window. Remember, they lived in the ground floor apartment. So pretty much anyone could have just walked up and started tapping on the glass. No climbing or levitating or any of that stuff was involved, so there was nothing inherently worrying or creepy about someone knocking on the glass. The storyteller then gets up, walking towards the window before drawing back the curtains, only to reveal the face of a complete stranger. Not their grandfather, not their uncle, but a complete and utter stranger. Surprised and confused, they back off from the window, letting the curtains slide back into place before this horrendous crash sounds. Broken glass tumbles onto the carpet at the foot of the curtains before another smash sends more glittering shards onto the floor in front of them. At that point, they said they just tossed their Yu-Gi-Oh cards onto the floor and bailed. Rushing out of the back door of the apartment and over to a neighbor's house, pounding on the door in a state of abject terror as they looked over their shoulder every so often to ensure the mysterious predator wasn't hot in pursuit. But thankfully... The neighbor answers the door, lets our storyteller in, before taking the time to calm them down to get the full story out of them. Naturally, they called the cops immediately, who rushed over since they were given the description of a home invasion in progress. The neighbor then gets in touch with the storyteller's mom to let them know the awful news, who immediately rushes home to comfort their terrified son. Then after that, both the neighbor and storyteller's mom accompany them back to the apartment, where the cops are still searching the property and surrounding area for any sign of the attempted intruder. Apparently one of the cops approaches the mom at this point and shows her something in a clear plastic evidence bag. Mom stares at it, turns pale, then kneels down and hugs our storyteller tight, fighting to hold back tears as the neighbor guy is just like, my god. 
They both ended up staying at the grandma's place for like a week after while the window was repaired. And if that seemed like a bizarre amount of time to fix a window and that something else might be behind them staying away from the apartment for a while, you'd be right in thinking that. Our storyteller had their suspicions for a little while, but they were too young to really understand the implications of what had happened. The kind of danger they'd been in wasn't clear until many years later, when their mom explained to them just what happened that evening. You see, it wasn't just the window that was being replaced. The entire apartment was being fitted with new, incredibly sturdy locks, CCTV cameras, just about everything short of a panic room, all being paid for by grandma and grandpa. The whole family was absolutely terrified and it was all down to the piece of evidence that the cops showed to the mom that night, the little thing in the clear plastic evidence baggie that made her turn ashen and squeeze our storyteller in a big, trembling bear hug. What was in that plastic bag was a photograph. A photograph of a young boy curled up in bed, sleeping soundly, and that boy was our storyteller. The mom told a much older storyteller that the photo couldn't have been taken long before the attempted break-in. Something about the sheets on the bed being fairly new or something, I can't quite remember. Or maybe it was a new haircut storyteller had gotten. But either way, it was some detail in there that made it clear that the attempted intruder had broken into the apartment somehow, maybe only a week prior, and taken a photograph of our storyteller while they slept. I can only imagine they had done so to several other children too, making a little catalog of potential victims, perusing them for hours on end before finally deciding on one they liked the most. I think that's what made my blood run cold back when I read their story. The idea that the intruder had taken this perverse liking to them, one that was strong enough for them to be unable to resist their urges, or whatever kind of sick, twisted desires had them smashing that window in that evening. The family only felt safe again when they heard the news that the creeper whose M.O. was eerily similar to their own experiences was caught by police and jailed after being extradited to another state. But they kept the whole thing a secret from our storyteller until he was in his late teenage years. There was no more details after that. There wasn't any grand conclusion, just that it was something that had haunted him for years. I never read anything as horrifying as that on that Discord server. It made everything else seem tame in comparison, and I stopped reading shortly afterward. It's weird how we seek out scary stories sometimes, just to give ourselves a little thrill but end up being genuinely traumatized, not by the spoopy skeleton stories, but by things that we know could have easily happened for real. I used to play a lot of Insurgency Sandstorm with a fixed set of guys and a few girls and we used to organize using a Discord server. People came and went as time went by but there were a couple of us that actually stayed in touch quite frequently outside of just organizing gaming sessions and became pretty good friends. Insurgency, for those that haven't played it, is one of those hyper-realistic military shooters that tends to get really really intense and occasionally downright terrifying when it's at its best. I'm not saying we had this proper Band of Brothers vibe going, I know it's only a video game, but like I said, a handful of us ended up being pretty good friends and bonding over the intense level of teamwork required to win rounds, not to mention the sweaty palmed adrenaline fueled firefights. One of these was a lad named Colin. One day, Colin tells us that he wouldn't be playing Insurgency for a little while because he had taken a job teaching English as a foreign language out in Indonesia. He had wanted to do some traveling for a while but just didn't have the money available to him and getting qualified to teach English gave him an opportunity to see some more exotic areas of the world whilst getting paid for it. We were pretty gutted to hear the news. He was one heck of a sniper and many a time we'd been pinned down by some enemy machine gunner only for the gunfire to stop suddenly followed by a little laugh from Colin and a have that in his Scottish accent. We absolutely loved him for moments like that, but we were also really happy for him, and since he promised to stay in the Discord server, we'd be able to keep in touch and hear some stories of his adventures out in the tropics. So a few months go by, and we're enjoying hearing the stories of his travels, 
along with being updated with photos of him exploring some pretty remote parts of Indonesia. It was the photos of him with the school kids he was teaching that really made me smile, though. He looked like he was having the time of his life, especially when we saw some videos of him teaching the kids some pretty obscure English phrases. Not only that, but occasionally we'd hear some of the kids actually repeat the phrases back kind of in a Scottish accent, and the idea of a bunch of Indonesian kids learning to speak English with an Edinburgh accent was absolutely hilarious to us. I mean, imagine it. Some American wishing an Indonesia fellow good morning or something only to hear, You alright, pal? Who's it going? In response, it still makes me chuckle even now, to be honest. Then, in September of 2018, I woke up to the news that there had been an earthquake in the sea just off the coast of Indonesia, causing an earthquake that had resulted in a massive tsunami that had destroyed huge sections of the country. Immediately, I thought of Colin. I jumped on the Discord using the app on my phone and sent him a message asking him if everything was alright and hoping he'd not been caught up in the tsunami. Obviously, there was a huge 7 or 8 hour time difference between the UK and Southeast Asia, and occasionally Colin didn't reply for hours, so the fact that he didn't immediately reply wasn't a massive concern to me. But he didn't reply all that day, to the point where I started expressing concerns to some of the other lads in the server, sharing the news of the tsunami with them and mentioning that I was worried Colin had been caught up in it. We knew from the news stories about which areas of Indonesia had been affected, but we didn't know exactly where Colin was, only that he was in some remote areas and didn't always have immediate access to Wi-Fi, another reason for us to not immediately worry. But he didn't reply the next day either, or the day after that, and it got to the point where a week had gone by and we'd heard nothing back from him. No one had seen Colin, even online, since we got news of the tsunami. That's when we really started to worry, and as the days went by, we got more and more frightened that something had happened to him. It's around then that I started going back through some of the messages he'd been sending over the previous month or so. He'd been all over Indonesia, and had spent his first few weeks in the capital city of Jakarta, which had remained relatively unaffected by the earthquake and subsequent tsunami. But then I found out that he'd traveled to a place called Palu to teach English there, and as far as I could tell, that's where he'd been at the time of the disaster, when it struck. I then cross-referenced the name of the place with any stories about the tsunami, and found out that it had been one of the worst affected by a destructive tidal wave that had apparently reached 23 feet in height. 23 feet of rushing water that had destroyed pretty much everything in its path, and caused the deaths of over 15,000 people, and in all likelihood, Colin had been one of them. We were devastated, but the worst part is, even to this day, we still have not had any closure about it. We knew Colin quite well, but he kept his online and personal life pretty separate. We never knew his last name or the names of any of his family, so it's not like we could get in touch with them to find out if he really had died or not, or to see about any funeral arrangements if he had indeed perished during the tsunami. But I think the fact that even now his Discord account lies inactive is evidence of the fact that he did actually lose his life out there. Maybe he's okay, and he just never bothered to get back on Discord. Maybe his close encounter with death made him realize that video games were just a waste of time or something. But I think that's just wishful thinking on my part. In my heart of hearts, I know he's probably dead. I just hope he's at peace now, and whatever family he had are okay. Rest in peace, Colin. We still miss you. So a few years ago, I matched with a girl on Tinder who I ended up having some serious chemistry with. We go for coffee coffee ended up being drinks, drinks ended up with sparks flying, and then boom, we're in the middle of this whirlwind romance. We're texting all the time whenever we're not just spending days at each other's apartments, fantasizing about taking vacations together, all the stuff two young people do when they got that new relationship energy going. But then one day, right when I think things couldn't get any more perfect, she sits me down with the obvious intention of having a pretty serious talk. I figured it was like a breakup type thing, so I braced myself for the worst. 
only it's not quite as bad as I feared. It was just, well, weird. She tells me she's Polly. At the time, I had no idea what that meant, so I just sort of stared back at her with this confused look on my face, prompting her to explain that Polly is short for polyamorous. For those that aren't entirely savvy with the term, it's basically a fancy word for when someone practices open relationships. The girl says she can commit to me, but that she'd have to be free to see other people, albeit in a less serious capacity. Being young, dumb, and totally besotted with her, I agreed to it, and it ended up being the worst decision I'd ever made. I started off by telling her she could do what she wanted, but only as long as she didn't tell me about any of it. She agrees to this, but as the weeks went by, I did start to get a little jealous. She sought to remedy this by introducing me to the app that she'd used to find other polyamorous types to hook up with, a little thing called Discord. Now apparently it's primarily used for communicating in video games, but I learned that people use Discord for all types of weird stuff, including hookups. The girl tells me I'm welcome to join the server she was a part of and look for someone who was open to something casual. Fair is fair, I thought, so I did. I made an account and got her to invite me to a little server that was innocuously called The Farm, despite having absolutely nothing to do with anything remotely agricultural. So upon joining, the girl introduces me as her partner and gets a few of the members to walk me through all the various channels and such. They were actually pretty nice, talking me through some of the elements of polyamory and waxing lyrical about how nice the girl I was seeing was which, I don't know, kind of warmed me up to the whole idea. I get talking to another girl on there, we vibe a little, but I can't see anything happening with her. I basically just did it to make the girl I was seeing happy, which apparently it really did. I had gained myself a lot of brownie points from it. So all is well that ends well, right? Mm, nope. About a week into being on the Discord server, I get a message from someone at first I assumed was a girl. We swap greetings and make a little small talk, then I get a picture message coming through. It turns out this was not a girl at all. It was a dude, and the picture was the only thing I really, really did not want to see. What exactly it was, I'll leave up to your imagination. But just imagine the worst possible thing a perverted dude could send you over the internet, and yeah, you got it. He follows the picture up by saying he wanted to hook up with me and my girl at the same time. I just ignore the messages, assuming the dude is going to get kicked from the server for rule breaking or something, and eventually bring it up with my girl. She, on the other hand, vouches for this guy, saying she's been talking to him for a while, how he's normally perfectly nice and polite, and that I'm making a big deal out of nothing, claiming I'm just being jealous, etc. I tell her I'm super uncomfortable with the idea of a three-way hookup, how I want nothing to do with it, but again that she's welcome to do whatever she wants, just as long as I don't have to hear about it. Drama smoothed over, and I think that's the end of it. Only, it's not. Not by a long shot. Cut to like a month later, things are still basically going strong with the girl, and I'm out doing some grocery shopping when I notice something that catches my eye. It was one of those things that you just don't really pay attention to unless it happens. Like, it's hard to describe. Pretty much every single person who walks into a grocery store either grabs a cart or a basket, right? And people just running in to grab one or two items are in and out in like a minute. So I remember seeing this one dude just kind of walking up and down the aisles with nothing in his hands and thinking like, what the heck is this guy doing here? But he's not doing anything too weird, so I just sort of move on. Only time and time again, I'm in an aisle grabbing things off of shelves and I see him just kind of idling, and a few times we make eye contact. Nothing too creepy, just like a casual glance, but this happened over and over again, to the point where I was like, is this dude following me? Anyway, I get my shopping done, walk back to my apartment, and forget all about it. A few hours later, and I'm sitting in my apartment alone, just chilling and nursing some big food baby from a local Chinese place I got delivery from, I hear footsteps on the stairs outside my apartment. Heavy ones. Nothing unusual as such, but then the front door to the apartment just goes boom, shaking from some heavy impact on the other side. At first I thought it was a neighbor or something, so I shout out like, What are you doing, dude? But there's no reply. Just another loud bang against the door. 
they're not trying to get my attention. They're trying to break in. And I just about jump out of my skin, just like instinctively grabbing my phone to dial 911 while I run in my bedroom, kneeling down to the safe under my bed which has my 40 caliber in it. I tell the dispatcher what's going on. She then says the cops are on their way, but I have no idea how much time I've got, so I run back into the hallway with my pistol locked and loaded, aiming at the door and shouting that cops are on their way. But this does nothing to deter whoever's on the other side. They just keep slamming against the front door, and each time it seems like the door is closer and closer to just giving way. Only when I'm like, I got a 40 here, buddy, don't make me do it, does the banging stop, and this is like perfectly time to hear approaching sirens too. I then hear more heavy footsteps on the stairs outside, and then all is quiet. A short time later, I'm giving my statement to the cops that arrive. I have my phone in my hand and I see a notification come up from the girl that I'm seeing that just says, I'm sorry. I wait until the cops leave to call her to be like, why are you sorry? Is this us breaking up or whatever? And when she answers, she's in tears. Through her sobbing, she tells me something that makes my jaw drop. And here's basically a summation of what she said. She's been hooking up with the guy who'd sent me the unwanted picture who had apparently gotten super weird once he was in her apartment, telling her she needed to break up with me because he wanted her as his main partner. He went off about how I wasn't down with polyamory, how I wasn't good for her, blah blah blah, and when he's gotten aggressive about it, she'd kicked him out and told him not to contact her again. This guy is from a city on the other side of the state, and my girl figured that he'd just drive back home. Only he doesn't and apparently he'd gleaned enough information about me from her, maybe even gone through her phone to get a look at some pictures of me to be able to actually track me down. And that's when it hits me. It was him in the grocery store, who had then followed me back to my apartment, waited until it was dark, then tried to break in to do God knows what. Confront me, beat me up, kill me, God only knows. Now this polyamory stuff wasn't just making me jealous, it was putting me in actual freaking danger. If that guy had only been a little more patient, waited for me to go outside to take the trash out, anything like that, I legit might not be around to type this experience out. And that scared the life out of me, as I imagine it would any of you. Me and the girl broke up shortly afterward. It was kind of sad, sure, but the whole experience had totally soured the relationship way beyond any kind of repair. We never talked again after that, but not before I told her to tell that creepy SOB that we'd broken up, that I wanted nothing to do with any of that anymore, and to leave me alone, or he'd be going back to his hometown in a wooden box. Now just hearing or reading the word Discord leaves a bad taste in my mouth, as I know the kind of creeps that are out there, using the internet for far worse than just some innocent kink stuff. So I'm a big PC gamer and I played a lot of online stuff with my mates anyways, but then the lockdown hits and my gaming time shoots up like tenfold. Lack of hours at work, social distancing, basically a bunch of stuff contributes to me playing a lot more than usual. So me and a few mates are using Discord voice chat one night while we're on Overwatch, just blazing round after round when a mate of ours, Phil, starts doing something really bloody weird. At one point, we're like hearing a whispering noise coming from someone's mic. I remember just ignoring it at first until it got so frequent that we start calling it out like, who's whispering down the mic? It's really creepy. No one owns up to it, which just sort of makes me laugh at first, partly out of being genuinely amused and partly just out of nervousness because it was legit creepy that no one was owning up to it. But it carries on even after someone calls it out, so I ended up checking Discord watching all the little icons until the whispers started up again. It was coming from Phil's mic. And now that I was seeing it for real, it did sound like Phil's voice, so I'm like, Yo, Phil, stop whispering, dude. It's weirding me out. What, are you possessed or something? But instead of being like, Ah, you got me, Phil insists that he's not whispering. At first, I just laughed and was like, Dude, I'm looking at everyone's icon and I can see it's you. You're not fooling me on this one. 
But again, Phil is insistent that he's not whispering, then actually whispers after he speaks, kind of like he's just doing it to mess with me. Again, I confront him, laughing like, you just did it again. Only he just gets angry, tell me I don't know what I'm talking about, and he's not doing any whispering that whole time. That's when the mood changes. We can hear in his voice that he's deadly serious, that he himself believes that he's not whispering even though he blatantly is. I mean it was either an Oscar winning performance out of our junk rap playing friend, or he seriously believed he wasn't whispering. And God love him, Phil is no actor. Either way, the mood got super, super tense in the voice chat and it wasn't brought up again. To this day I have no idea what was going on there. He doesn't play much with us anymore so it's not like we got a chance to hear the whispers again. I don't know if it was some kind of mental problem or whatever but it honestly was the creepiest moment I've ever had in a discord voice call. I mean, stomach droppingly creepy. So wherever you are Phil, whatever you're up to, I hope you're doing better mate. I really do. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and remember, to always let Perdeep hunt squirrels for you. <laughs>